Good morning. How many of you know we get fed incredibly, incredibly here? The word, yeah, give the, give it, yeah, everybody give that church a hand. <clears throat> God just moves in our lives and gives us so much here at Cathedral. Can I challenge you this year to take what you get from Cathedral Church and to give it away? Don't keep it to yourself. You've got neighbors who don't know Jesus. You've got people you work with who do not know Jesus. Take it to them. Maybe just take them a sandwich one day. Or maybe you've got a neighbor that you haven't talked to that you can take out his trash to the road and set it by the road. Because once you do that, he's going to come to you and say, why are you doing this? I just want you to know the man that I know who loves you so much. Amen? So take what you get here from Cathedral and share it with everybody you know and let this be a year of victory for everybody in the church. Amen? God bless you. Thank you so much. Take that with you. Take that with you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Well, I'm super excited now because I haven't talked to BH since before Christmas. So BH has no idea what I'm speaking about today, but he literally just drilled the message that I have for you guys today. So no doubt that the Spirit of God says the same thing, right? So uh, that's an obvious just uh, affirmation to me that this is a word from the Lord. So I'm excited for you guys. Excited for everybody online. You'll notice I have a lovely candle here that I stole from my dining room table. So candle lighting is going to be a part of our service today. So if you're watching online, go ahead right now while we're going through all the introductory stuff. Go around the house, find you a candle, something where you can participate later on in the service. And if you're in here and maybe you were like ninja your way in here and you got past our guest services without getting a candle, go right on back there or hold your hand up. Those guys will bring you a candle because we want to make sure that everybody can participate. Well, I'm super excited about today. I'm super excited about the message, specifically the title, because y'all know me, I'm a movie guy, and I love movies, and I specifically love sci-fi movies. And so when I was thinking about this weekend, I was like, Lord, what in the world, what, what do you want me to, to share with your people? Because we're coming off of a phenomenal entire month of Christmas at Cathedral, capped off with a new a Christmas uh, Eve service that was phenomenal. And then next week, you heard Dave talk about we're kicking off the 21 days of prayer and fasting, the watch. It is just the launch of 2023. I said, Lord, this, this weekend's kind of in between. And I was like, ooh, the in-between. <laughs> yeah, I could get on board with that. That sounds like a good sci-fi movie, doesn't it? The in-between. And so literally, that's what today's message is about. And the more I thought about it, I said, man, you know, our life is full of in-betweens. How about the in-between of moving from childhood to adulthood? You know, I can still remember being a senior in high school and freaking out because for me, my high school, my friends in school, they were more of a family to me than my own family was. And I knew that in just a few short months, we're going to graduate and they're all leaving. And I had no idea what I was going to do. Or how about this one? The in-between of adulthood to parenthood. You get that test. It's positive. And mom and dad are like, I, I don't know what to do. And you know, you ladies, y'all have a little bit of a jump on us because at least you get to experience this incredible miracle growing on the inside of you. Us guys, we're like, uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and we don't until that baby comes out of that womb and cries for the first time. And it's like God just unlocks all this stuff inside of us that we never even knew was there. Or what about this in between? The in between of in between parenthood and empty nest. I mean, you can see it coming. It's on the horizon. You're like, God, Lord, what am I going to do? I'm going to have all this money and time. What do I do with it? <laughs> I haven't had it for 20 years. Ah, it's like I, I don't know what to do. You know, so there's all these in-betweens in our life. And then I had this thought. We are living in a world that is in-between. We live in a world that is in-between paradise lost and paradise restored. 
And so we, we need to understand more than ever God's word, his Bible, because if you don't, this world makes no sense whatsoever. It literally is like stepping into the middle of a sci-fi movie where you can't figure out what's good and what's bad, and you can't figure out who the good guys are and the bad guys are, what's up, what's down. That is the mark of this world that we're living in. But the cool thing about the Bible is you go into the Bible and when you open it up, you have this whole front part here that we call the Old Testament. And this is all the description of this amazing paradise that God created for all of us, for mankind to truly live and have life. And then it's the tragedy of that paradise being lost. And then it's the whole history of mankind of how we got here, of what the story looks like, and the promise throughout the whole thing that God was going to rescue us. That yes, paradise was lost, but a Savior is coming. A Messiah is coming. He's going to rescue you from this fallen world. And then you jump to the end, and when you go to the end, you see, here's how it all wraps up. At the back of the Bible, we see exactly how everything is going to end. We know how it's going to end. And we see paradise restored, God's plan for the end of time. And then in between is this little section of the Bible that has recorded in it the life of the most amazing man that's ever walked the face of the earth, the greatest miracle ever, the Son of God himself leaving heaven to come as a child and as a baby and give his life for us. And then the rest of the Bible, the rest of this little section is all about how we live in this world that is in between because according to that section of the Bible, when you put your faith and trust in Christ, you become somebody different. You're not the way that you used to be. You no longer are the person that you were. You're a new person. The Bible even calls you a new creation. And it gives us the instructions on how do you live as a new creation, as a foreigner in this in-between world. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at those instructions. Because the thing about in-betweens is what marks all of them is you are always leaving the known for the unknown. You know what life is like where you are. You know what life is like in this season that you've been in, but you don't know what life is going to be like over here. I even, some people even have trepidation about the book of Revelation, about the end, about this paradise restored because they, they don't know it. And when you don't know it in the unknown, there can be fear and anxiety and worry and, and what if this and what if that? And how many of you know God doesn't want us to have fear and he doesn't want us to be confused? And I'm promising you, he has laid out in here everything from start to finish. So what we're going to do right now is exactly what Pastor B said. We're going we're gonna to bring it down a little bit. We're going we're gonna to come down to the simplest of things and look at how do I live my life in this in-between place? How do I position myself to be who God's called me to be? And so I want to go to Ephesians Chapters 4 and 5, because Paul, who was a man who wrote a lot of what we call the New Testament, he wrote a a lot of letters to churches, giving them instructions on exactly that, of how to live in this fallen world. And Paul was a man whose life was radically changed by Jesus. He became a radically different person before he knew God and after he knew God. Jesus Christ radically changed his life. And in Ephesians chapter 4, he gives us just some great passages to help us understand what's going on. And beginning in verse 17, he describes to us what it's like for people who don't know the Lord. He said, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do. Gentiles being people who don't have a relationship with God. For they are hopelessly confused. Anybody seen any hopeless confusion going on in our world right now? Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. So when I read verses like this, it helps me. It helps me to not be so condemning of my fellow man, especially if they don't know the Lord. If they don't know the Lord, you cannot expect them to act any other way than hopelessly confused with a mind full of darkness. Because according to God's word, that's what it is. You don't ever hear Jesus describe life on this earth as, hey, this is a pretty cool place. (laughs) Hey, you know this time y'all are living in, this is a pretty good time. Yeah, it's pretty chill. You have some cool things going on, cool things happening. No, Jesus 
always describes this period of time we're living in as dark and wicked and evil. That's not you and I, though, because we carry something in us that he has in them. And that we find out in this next section of verses, beginning of verse 21. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature. Your old sinful nature is the hopeless confusion, the mindful of darkness. Get rid of that and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. And instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So now Paul says, look, you're different you're not the same that you were. I know you might feel the same. I know that when you prayed that prayer and you asked Christ to come into your heart, maybe like Paul, you had a radical change. Maybe you radically felt different, but maybe you didn't feel much different at all. What I'm telling you is you need to get in here and hear what Jesus says about you, that you're a new creation because I need you to start cooperating with him and, and putting off that old way of doing things and start putting on this new way of doing things. And what does that look like? Find out in, in chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear, ch dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So he's saying imitate God. Well, you can say, well, how, Eddie, I, don't, I, I can't even see God. How in the world do I imitate God? One of the reasons that Jesus came. Jesus lived his life as this child of light, as an example. Yes, he came to die on the cross. Yes, he came to rescue us and pay the penalty for our sins. But he also came to show us the heart of the Father. You remember what the religious people's biggest complaint about Jesus was? Is that he spent all his time going out there and hanging out with the dregs of society. He went out there and he purposefully went around the people that hung out in the bars. He purposefully went out there and got around the people that had addictions that were trapped in hopelessness and darkness. That's who he went to because that's who he came for because the religious people had mucked it all up. They had twisted it. They, they were not showing the love of God. They were not showing grace and mercy. They were not trying to love them into a relationship with God. They were condemning them for how they behaved and how they acted, and how they lived their life. And Jesus said, how can you do that when you haven't even shown them who the heart of the Father is? So Paul says that's our job. And one last verse here in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, for once you were full of darkness. But now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. One of the things that I always try to do, and I'd recommend this for anybody that, that you, and maybe you grew up with the Lord. Maybe, maybe praise God if you did. You're like my daughter that's sitting on the front row, and I praise God every day that she grew up in this house. She grew up with that relationship with God. But I never lose sight, and I never forget what it felt like to live the first 25 years of my life in this darkness and confusion. I never, ever wanted to think about what was going to happen to me when I died because I didn't know. And so I drank and I did a lot of other things to, to keep me in a state of mind where I didn't have to think about that because that was the unknown. And I had no clue what that was like and I had no clue of how to get on any different path than the path that I was on. So here's what I want to do just for a moment. I want to step away from Paul and go to Jesus. You know, typically this is the point in the message where we've kind of laid it all out. Hey, live as children of light. You used to be this way. Now that you've accepted Christ, that's no longer who you are. You are this new person. So begin to live this new life and put on this new life that you have from Christ. And so we do a video testimony or I would give you a personal story of something that I've done that kind of helps connect the dots. But I really felt like I wanted this morning to give you a day in the life of Jesus. Because I think it's important for us to understand that he understands. And coming out of these past couple of years that we're all coming out of with loss and trauma and pain, I think it's important for you to see how would Jesus handle that? Because it's right there in the Bible. In Jesus, in Jesus, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 15, chapter 14, chapter 14, this, this day in the life of Jesus, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read the verses, I just want to describe it to you. 
This is a day where Jesus has been going through his ministry, doing what he does, teaching about the kingdom of God, healing people. He is full-blown launching into his ministry. And this particular morning, he wakes up preparing, as I would imagine, to do the same that he has been doing. Except this day is going to be different. Because as he's preparing, men come to him who were friends and disciples of his cousin, John the Baptist. And they say to him, Jesus, we have bad news. Your cousin, John the Baptist, is dead. He was beheaded by the king. And so Jesus gets this horrendous news. This is, this is not just somebody who helped pave the way for his ministry. This is somebody that is a blood relative. This is his cousin. And he gets that terrible news and he wants to do what we all want to do. He wants to get away, be by himself, and process what has just happened. So that's exactly what he does. He gets in the boat, and he goes to head to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and he tells his disciples, just, just stay here. I, I, I need to be alone. I need some time to myself. And he's headed to a very remote area on the other side of the lake. The problem is, as he heads out, is the people are watching as he goes, and they figure out where he's headed. And so they launch out to follow him. And as they go, they're picking up more and more people along the way so that by the time Jesus can get to the other side, there are thousands of people waiting. And the Bible says that Jesus looks at them. And again, all he sees when he looks at them is, is darkness and hopeless confusion. And he can't just turn that off and say, hey, y'all just need to back off. I need space. I need time. No. He starts doing what he does. He ministers to them. He heals them. He teaches them. And this goes on all day. And then it begins to get close to the evening. And the disciples are like, Jesus, like, we're, we're in the middle of nowhere. And it's getting late. So you need to send these people back home because they need to eat. They need to get home before it gets dark. And Jesus, and that's not a problem. You're going to feed them. You know, we'll, we, don't, we don't have any, any food. He said, well, just go find me something. Surely somebody here has something. And they find one person who has a very meager meal that could feed one person. And Jesus blesses that meal and it's divided and it feeds over 5,000 people. And then all that is done and everybody has their belly full and everybody is satisfied. And Jesus sends them on their way. And so finally Jesus has a chance to decompress, to process what he's dealing with. And so he says to the disciples, okay, guys, y'all get in the boat and head back to the other side, okay? I just, I just need some time. I need some time. And so they do. They get in the boat and they head back across. And it's when they're on their way across that lake that a horrible storm comes up. And they're terrified. It's dark. It's storming. And here comes Jesus again, walking on the water, right up to the boat. It's the, it's the story where Peter calls out and says, Jesus, if that's you, call me out to come to you. And he does. And Peter begins to walk on the water. Here's the point I want you to understand about that one day in Jesus' life. I just told you about three of the greatest miracles he ever performed feeding over 5,000 people, walking on the water, Peter walking on the water, and it happened on the worst possible day of his life. Because it's not about just Jesus and what he could give. It was about this light and this life that comes through the Father. And he was so in touch with the heart of God. And he was so in touch with, I want so bad to be by myself. I want so bad to process this. But time is running out. It is limited. I am in between where I was and where we're going to be. And I have to get this done. I don't, I don't have the time. I can't. I've got to stay about my father's business. I've got to stay about showing and sharing the heart of my father. I, just, I can't fathom it when I think about it because what Jesus understood was if I tell these people, I'm sorry, but I have to deal with my own loss. I cannot, I cannot minister to you right now. What he knew was they would connect the dots and say, well, that is the heart of God towards me. That right now God's just too busy. That right now God's just got too much going on. And Jesus was able to power through his own grief, his own loss, and kind of compartmentalize it where it belonged, which was as a result of the sick, wicked, and evil, dark, twisted, confused world that he was in. And understanding that that is not the end. Understanding that paradise is going to be restored. He knows he's going to see John again, and he knows where John is. 
So one last verse of scripture that I want to read to you that comes out of Matthew chapter 4 because these are the very words of Jesus himself. This is what Jesus says about you and I, those of us that are put our faith and trust in Christ. He says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So according to Jesus, that's our role. We carry this light. And we're to take this light, just like Pastor B said, and we're to share this light. The purpose of it being that people can see and feel and experience the love and the heart of God. So what we're going to do right now, one more passage of scripture that I'm not going to read. I kind of want to do a a dramatic presentation. That was pretty dramatic right there. A dramatic, where did that one come from? I know I came up with one, that thing just magically appeared right there. This is kind of a, I kind of, every now and then, there's just a passage of scripture that I just realized, man, if you can get a certain visual for it, it just really helps encapsulate it in your mind. And what I love about this particular verse of scripture is it it, it helps you understand the role that Jesus plays. Sometimes I think people think this. I think people sometimes think, you know, God created paradise and then Adam and Eve fell and then God had to come up with a plan. Sometimes I think people think, they're like, oh gosh, that didn't work. What what in the world am I going to do? Oh, you know what? Hey, I'll have a son. I'll do that. I'll have a son that he can get. No, no, no. Jesus was in the very beginning with God. And what I love about this passage of Scripture is in just a few short verses, five verses, you see Jesus from the very beginning all the way to where we are right now. And then you get an understanding of what our real role is. So right now we're going to darken all the lights Because this passage in John takes place at a time when the world was very dark. You see, it used to be that that God would speak to the children of Israel through his prophets. And he would speak often of the coming Messiah and the promise of a rescue. But even though he did that, people were still losing hope. And then you have this period of about 500 years where there have been no prophets. And it's gotten so dark that people really have lost all hope. And just like God does so many times, there's so many times that we think there's no possible way he could come through now. It's too late. It's too late. He's missed the window. But he always knows exactly what he's doing. And so the verses go like this, the first five verses of John. In the beginning was the word, Jesus And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him, God created everything. And nothing was created without Him. In Him was life. And that life was the light for mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. The purpose of today's message is to bring everything down because we're living in a time that is so full of distractions. And everything that is not about this precious light is a distraction. Politics are a distraction. COVID is a distraction. The umpteen thousand conspiracy theories of which my wife and I regularly investigate are a distraction. (laughs) This is all that matters. And I love the simplicity of the flame. Because you see, this light is not fragile, but it is precious. It needs to be tended and taken care of. It's like you have this beautiful rose from God living within you and you need to take care of it and be mindful of it. And this light is not overpowering 
but it is powerful. It can change the life of a human being and not just your life, the life of everyone around you. It can alter the destinies of families for all eternity. And I'll be honest, this light will not solve all your problems. But this light is the promise of all of your problems solved. And so now you and I, carry what Jesus said is the light of the world, what we know is his light, his spirit in us. And now you and I are called to take this light. It's the light of our future. It's the light of paradise restored. It's, it's, a, it's a tiny, tiny little piece of an eternity that you and I can't even possibly fathom or imagine that resides in us. And now God says, I need you to take that and I need you to share it. And I need you to, to go to your neighbor, Sean, because Sean's lawnmower is broken down. And I don't want you to wait for him to ask. I need you to go ahead and cut his grass for him. And you know what? He's got a couple of young boys, and they just ran ramshot all over that house all the time. You need to go over there and give the poor man a break. Take his family a dinner. Do something to help him out. Show him what the love of God is like. And you know, you've got this coworker that you work with, Chelsea. And I get it, she's cynical and she's bitter and she's always complaining. <laughs> and I understand she's sarcastic and she's got a mouth like a sailor. But you know what you need to do? Man, you need to love that girl. You need to love her. You need to make sure that she doesn't feel any guilt or condemnation coming from you. Because she watches you. She knows you go to church. And to her, you're God. However you treat her is how she imagines God treating her. And so you just need to love her. And then hopefully by your interaction or somebody else's interaction later on, they too now get this incredible light that is living in them. And then we have these times where we come together for church or we get together during the week in our small group. And man, we get them lights together and the light shines brighter. We're excited. Man, we're getting filled up. We're getting pumped up. We're just jacked up about what God is doing. But it's not just for us, right? God gets us all filled up and he says, okay, now let's go back out. Let's do it again. Let's go back out. Let's share that light. The most important thing you'll ever do in your life is being kind, being understanding, having grace, having mercy. Do you realize that this light represents an age of amazing grace that you and I are living in where God has literally said the doors to heaven are wide open and anybody who wants to come in may. All they have to do is say yes to my son. This is God's amazing grace. This is the in-between place where you and I live. We're not yet where we're going to be. And we can see where we've come from. But in between, God has a role for you and I to play in causing this light of the kingdom. This light, I don't care how dark you make this room. The darker you make this room, the brighter this light gets. It's the way God works. And so what we're going to do right now, just to kind of solidify this moment and just really help it stick with us, there's a song that has been passed down through the ages that is such a great illustration of this message. Because in the first two verses, it sings about how this amazing grace saves our life that despite who we are and what we've done, God has mercy on us and grace for us, and he saves our life. And then it sings about how this amazing grace carries us through this dark world that we're living in. That yes, we have trials and we have troubles, but it is the amazing grace of God that carries us through. And then we sing about that incredible paradise restored that we can't even fathom or imagine. And what it's going to be like one day to be in the very presence of God never again having to deal with any problems or any troubles or any sorrows or any heartache or any pain, being completely healed and whole. So as we sing this song, Amazing Grace, we're going to light these candles. We're going to keep the lights down. I just want it to, to sit in you, that you carry this very light. As this light moves across your rows, it is resemblance of the Spirit of God and the life of God moving in your heart. 
Let's sing this together. Would you just repeat this after me? Father God, I hold this light that represents your love. And I know that your love lives in me. Would you help me to not get distracted and to not ever lose sight of those in darkness around me who so desperately need this light. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, if you would, just gently blow out your candle. They're going to bring the house lights up. And while you hold that just for a moment and let it cool off, I just want to bless you with this. I want to bless you with the awareness that this Bible, this is not a collection of the thoughts and the ideas of men who decided to write them down. This Bible is the very Word of God. It describes to you paradise as it originally was meant to be in the history of all the world that has brought us to where we are, it shows to you the glorious future that awaits you and I for all of those who will just simply accept the salvation of Jesus. And then it gives us the instruction of living this life in between. Well, Eddie, my life's just not going quite the way I thought it would. I know that's the in-between life. I thought things would just be a whole lot better. I just thought once I accepted Christ, well, you know, some things may be better, but there's only so much better you can get when you're living in between. But if you know where you're headed, if you know that you know the glorious future that God has for you, man, this in between can throw at you what it wants. And you will not be moved and you will not be shaken and you will not have fear and you will not doubt because you'll know that you know that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, lives in you and greater is he that is in you than he that is in this dark, confused, and hurting world. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this is what I hope you guys will do is just this week, we've kind of boiled it down. It's just about that little light. So just start cutting out distractions. Go ahead right now and start preparing yourself for next weekend because next weekend we're going to dial in, get focused on God. Go ahead and start getting your hearts right right now, really tuning them into God. Go ahead and decide what you're going to cut out. Go ahead and delete every social media app you've got on your daggum telephone. Just go ahead and do some things that are going to make a difference. But most of all, do exactly what Pastor B said. Go to your neighbor, take him a meal just because. You see somebody's yards all messy, got a bunch of leaves and all that, go over there and rake them up for them just because. Just find a way, get creative and find a way to show kindness and love to people because that might open the door for them to say, why in the world are you doing this for me? And you say, man, because God loves you so much that I can't not love you. I have to show you how much he loves you because I know how much he loves me. And that's what I want you to know this Christmas season and this new year. I bless you guys with the awareness. Like Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And you don't put that light under a basket. You put it on a stand and you put it up for everybody to see so that they can glorify God. Amen? Amen. Lord bless you guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday.